Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This lecture is the second in our wood design series, and this lecture will focus on the directionality of wood strength and connect this topic back to what we learned about the tree growth process in the first lecture of this series. Let's go back to some topics of basic structural mechanics. Consider a small piece of material. This could be a piece of a beam, a column, or whatever else you please. A small enough element that the stress across it can be regarded as constant. In mechanics and other fields, this is referred to as a differential element. Consider this differential element shown. What kinds of stresses can we apply to this element? Well, if you recall from basic mechanics, there are three and only three things that we can do with it. Uh, first, we can pull on this element. We can try to lengthen it. We can apply pulling forces on either side of it. Um, and therefore, in response, the element must resist. We call this force and stress tension. Simple enough. Next, we can try to push on it. We can try to make it smaller in the direction of the applied force. We of course call this compression. Finally, we can distort the element by applying forces parallel to its faces, and we refer to this uh, force as shear. Now, um, if you remember from basic mechanics, it can be shown that the four force arrows on a shear element must be positioned like shown in this uh, drawing in order to maintain equilibrium uh, in this differential element when you consider both translation and rotational equilibrium. If you reverse the direction of one of the arrows, you must in turn reverse the direction of all of them. Thus, if you apply shear on one side of a differential element, you must in turn apply shear to all of them. So you cannot have a single isolated, uh, you cannot have a single isolated shear arrow on a plane stress element. You must have four shear arrows on it, simply from uh, that, and that simply arises from basic uh, static equilibrium. And, of course, we can apply stresses in any combination of the above. So, we can have tension on one face and compression on another. We can have shear uh, on all faces and tension on all faces as well. We can have shear on, some, on all of the faces and compression on some of the faces. These, of course, can be applied in any combination that you wish. Now, it is important to keep in mind that these three stress states are the fundamental stresses that can be applied to a differential element or to a piece of matter. So every other type of loading or stress is ultimately a combination of these fundamental elemental stresses. Uh, for example, when you load an axle in torsion, you place the section under shear stress. So you may take a long axle and twist the entire thing in torsion, but when you zoom in and look on an individual differential element or an individual stress element, you'll be putting that element into uh, shear stress. When you place a beam, for example, into bending, uh, you don't directly produce bending in an individual differential element. Rather, what you end up with is you put um, some of the differential elements in that section, in the cross section of the beam, into tension, uh, part of it into compression, and then you induce various levels of shear throughout. This is again just a review from uh, basic, uh, basic structural mechanics, basic civil or mechanical engineering mechanics. Now, remember back to previous coursework and consider what we refer to as an isotropic material. If you remember, an isotropic material is one that has the same properties in all directions. So for an example of an isotropic material, consider something like steel. Um, so think of a material such as steel. Consider a steel with a yield stress of say 50 ksi. This yield stress is completely independent of the direction, or the completely it's completely independent of the direction that I orient uh, a differential element. So I can put this differential element into vertical or horizontal tension, vertical or horizontal compression, and the material will yield at the exact same stress, 50 ksi. Uh, steel again is referred to as an isotropic material because it exhibits the same properties in all directions. I can, it doesn't matter what direction I pull on it, it will, or what direction I push on it, it will exhibit the same yield stress regardless of direction. Why is this? Consider this image shown of the microstructure of a sample of steel. Note the grain direction. 
Now, if you remember back to your study of materials, uh, you'll remember that metals such as steel are uh, have distinct crystalline structures uh, that form within the material. Note that the grains in the sample are oriented in a random direction. They're not all oriented to the left. They're not all oriented to the right. They're all not, or, or they're not all oriented from left to right. They're not all oriented from top to bottom. They're not all oriented at say a 45 degree angle. They are oriented in just a jumble random of directions, in a, in a random jumble of directions. Why is this? Well, think about how we actually make steel. How is this actually created? Well, we start with a large vat of liquid material, basically molten iron, molten steel. Uh, so we start with molten steel and we allow it to, to cool. We place it in a mold, we place it in some various shape, uh, we place it in some container that will give it the final form that we want, or in the case of some things like uh, hot rolled shapes, we allow it to cool into things like billets and then or streams material and then put it through rollers and hammers and things, And but anyway. The exact uh, section making property uh, process isn't too important for this discussion. The important thing to keep in mind is that when we're working with steel, we start with a liquid and then just let it cool naturally. So as it cools, individual crystals begin to form. These grow from a nucleation site and eventually form the final crystal structure of the material. This is basically the same way something like ice would form. Uh, so just like an ice crystal, if you think of it like an ice cube, you have crystals going in all sorts of different directions because an ice crystal starts forming just from random little bits of, oh, dust or other contaminants inside the water, and then grows from there. And molten steel is the same way. It starts just at a much higher temperature, of course. And so it starts, uh, the when, it's, when it cools sufficient to reach, the, uh, reach steel's melting point slash freezing point, individual crystals start to form. And because they just form in the bulk of the liquid material, they form in random directions. There is no preferential directions uh, for these crystals to form, and they also form at random locations. It's not like the crystals start forming at even spaces every, I don't know, it's not like they form, start forming every 10 micrometers or something. They form at random locations in random directions, and so there is no, thus the steel has no preferential direction for its material strength. So again, because crystals start forming in random locations and random directions, ultimately that gets locked into the uh, actual grain structure of the material. And so then you end up with grains going in random directions, and thus you have strength in random directions. Because there is no preferred direction for the uh, crystalline growth structure and crystalline growth pattern, there is no preferential direction for the material, the material's final strength. So, uh, what about another material, another common civil engineering material? Consider something like concrete. Now, uh, this may sound strange, but concrete is also an isotropic material. Now, if you have studied concrete design, you may uh, blanch a bit at that and say, wait, wait, wait a minute, you're probably misleading me here. I obviously know that concrete is much better in compression than it is in tension. In fact, if you've uh, studied concrete design, you know that when we're designing, say, reinforced concrete beams, we actually regard the, or consider, or approximate the tensile stress of, of concrete as zero. It's so low that we actually just ignore it completely and rely on steel to carry all of our tensile forces. So it is true that concrete does have different tensile and compressive strengths, but it's still isotropic, and the reason for that is that it is in that those tensile and, compre and compressive capacities are independent of direction. Concrete has a much higher strength in compression than in intention, but this again is independent of direction. Whether you compress it horizontally or vertically is irrelevant. Why is that? Let's connect back to the physical uh, microstructure of the material. How do you make concrete? Well, you start out with a liquid. You have a uh, mixture that's, well, actually, it's uh, concrete, liquid, solid. That's a very uh, difficult thing to say. It's, uh, huh. anyway, I'm not gonna worry about that. <laughs> Let's just say that uh, in concrete, you have a mixture of solids and liquids. Uh, well, one liquid water primarily, unless you have a super plasticizer, but um, <laughs> primarily uh, you have uh, water and a whole bunch of solids, uh, some in chunks, some dissolved in. You have water, you have sand, you have Portland cement, you have uh, coarse aggregate, fine aggregate, etc., any admixtures, whatever you're using, etc. But think about this. Um, 
when all of these things are put into, when all of these ingredients are put into a concrete mixer, or put into a concrete mix and then mixed together in a concrete mixer, all of the orientation of all the individual pieces of aggregate, they all get jumbled around. And then as the concrete or as the cement cures and everything is hard, goes through a hardening process, all of that, uh, all of that, uh, those elements that were randomly positioned then end up getting locked into place. But again, just like with the steel, even though we don't have the same crystal uh, forming process, we have some, but not quite the exact same process. It's more of a chemical reaction than a physical reaction. But um, the key thing to keep in mind is that all of your aggregate particles in concrete are oriented in just random jumbled directions. So it's, it's, they don't have a preferential uh, orientation in some direction. And because the individual particles that make up concrete do not cure in a way that, that gives preferential uh, bias to a certain direction, up, down, left, right, whatever it may be, you end up with final material properties that are also uh, direction agnostic. So um, again, we end up with con concrete ends up being isotropic because concrete has the same uh, randomly positioned microstructure or uh, aggregate structure in this case. So concrete starts as a liquid and the individual particle of uh, the individual particles harden in random directions. And that is why that concrete ultimately, just like steel, is an isotropic material, even though of course it is much stronger in compression than in tension. You don't have to have the exact same um, you don't have to have the exact same available stress uh, in all uh, modes of stress. Uh, the key is that if we pro apply a particular type of stress, whether it be shear, uh, tension, or compression, the material, in order to be isotropic, must display a resistance that is the same regardless of the direction that given type of stress is applied. So what about wood? Well, consider a tree. Uh, let's connect this back to some of the things we learned about in the previous lecture. Let's think about a tree, as shown. Uh, what kind of forces does it need to be able to resist? Well, the primary forces a tree must resist, in terms of applied loading, are gravity and wind. Now, there are some other minor forces uh, that do obviously happen to a tree, things like rain loading, um, uh, I suppose snow loading in the winter in climates that get snow, uh, in extremely rare cases you get seismic activity, etc. But the primary forces that a tree must resist are gravity and wind. So think about gravity. What does gravity do to a tree? Well, gravity places the trunk of the tree into compression and its limbs into flexure. So again, think about this. Gravity is pulling down on a tree. This wants to cause the branches to bend downward, so it places them in flexure, and the trunk has to carry all of the weight of all of the branches above it, so it goes into compression. So uh, then what about wind? Well, it places the limbs and trunk into flexure. Uh, wind applies a force to individual branches, which then puts them into bending. And the same thing for the trunk in terms of global, in, in a global case, rather than a local case of the individual limbs. So wind generally will put both the trunk and the branches into flexure. So um, again, the, these, the basic kinds of forces that uh, a tree will have to resist in its main design cases, in its main uh, environmental forces, wind and gravity, are flexure and compression. A tree's trunk doesn't normally go into tension. Uh, when it does go into, of course, when it goes into bending, part of the trunk will go into compression and part will go into tension. But in nature, rarely if ever does the entire trunk go into tension. That would be a very unusual case. It's hard to even think of a case where there would be so much uplift on a uh, uplift force on a tree that the trunk would go into tension. Now, I can probably come up with some contrived scenarios where that might happen. For example, if you think to wind design, uh, wind can produce uplift forces on various bodies, such as especially on flat surfaces like roofs and things. So, I suppose if a tree were were shaped just right and the wind was coming from just the right direction and it was strong enough, maybe once in a blue moon you could end up with a thing, a, a case where the up lift force from the wind on the tree actually exceeded its weight, but uh, that is an extremely rare case. Rarely, if ever, is there enough uplift force somehow on a tree to actually put the entire tree into uh, tension. Maybe an uh, earthquake uplift could also do that as well, but again, very rare, very uh, atypical activity. Rarely does the trunk of a tree go entirely into tension. So. Um, 
Now, next let us consider not only, not only the forces applied, compression, tension, etc., but the direction of the force in relation to the wood grain. Uh, remember, trees grow in certain directions. Uh, in limbs, the uh, tree gr grain is primarily growing horizontally, and in the trunk, the tree grain is primarily growing vertically. Again, uh, think of the trunk of a tree. In the trunk, the grain generally runs vertically from up to down. So that means that the compression force from gravity will go along the grain. In the trunk of a tree, which is where we get almost all of the, the which is where we get almost all of the wood that we actually use, the compression force from gravity will be going with the grain. And then what about bending? Again, we primarily use the trunk rather than branches. We only use branches on, we only actually harvest branches and use them in uh, structural materials for maybe some particularly large trees, if even then. Uh, but think again of the trunk of a tree. The tension and compression stresses from bending will be along the grain as well. So even in bending, the tension and compression forces will also be along the grain. So let's look uh, at the opposite case, or the 90 degree case if you want to call that opposite. So now consider tension and compression perpendicular to, get to the grain of the tree. Uh, again, consider tension and compression perpendicular to the grain in the trunk of a tree. How would such stresses occur? Well, uh, generally they won't. Uh, trees rarely experience tension or compression perpendicular to their grain direction, at least in their trunk. Well, actually, even in their branches. Um, again, they rarely experience tension and compression uh, perpendicular to the grain. The most common way would probably be if the trunk at some location is actually bent and not perfectly vertical. Sometimes trees can then grow, I'm sure as you've all, as you've all seen, or as I'm sure you've all seen, sometimes trees grow in weird and random directions, but for the idealized tree that we're considering with the, with the uh, trunk going perfectly vertical, growing straight upward uh, towards sunlight as things tend to grow, uh, trees will rarely have ever experience tension or compression perpendicular to the grain because that would involve uh, some great force pulling on the trunk of a tree or like uh, some large compression force uh, pushing the tree's trunk inward. If you were to like, uh, if you were to, for example, wrap a big chain around the trunk of a tree and somehow put that chain and uh, pull on that chain really tight and tighten it around the tree in a big, great big knot or like a, with a turnbuckle or something, that would put the tree's trunk into a uh, compression perpendicular to the grain. And so, yeah, you can come up with contrived scenarios of that will produce that, but in nature, you will generally never actually find, or at least in very rare cases, you will almost never find the trunk of a tree in either compression or tension perpendicular to the grain. So we've covered both tension and compression, but what about our other fundamental force, which is shear, our other fundamental stress, which is, which is shear? So shear will be induced by bending, but again, mechanics teaches us that shear in one direction produces shear in all four directions. So if we have shear that is perpendicular to grain, uh, say to the left, we will also have shear perpendicular to the grain uh, to the right. And we will also have shear parallel to the grain, both up and down. So again, uh, from basic mechanics, we know that with a square stress element or a small differential element, if you have shear in one direction uh, or about one face of a differential element, you have shear about all four faces. Um, thus, a tree will experience shear stresses both parallel and perpendicular to grain. If you think back to your mechanics, uh, mechanics coursework and studies, when you put a beam into bending, you end up produ yes, you do produce bending stresses, which are tensile and compressive uh, stresses uh, about its neutral axis, etc. But you also produce shear stresses. So there are very few things on a tree that will directly produce shear stresses, except maybe like uh, maybe some point loads on the branches of a tree, for example. But uh, generally, there are very few things that are going to that, that are going to um, directly apply shear to, say, the trunk of a tree. But whenever you have bending, you also have shear, and bending uh, from, say, wind force will produce shear forces in the trunk of a tree. But again, because we have shear in one direction, we'll have shear about all four faces of differential element, which means we, which means that trees in nature do experience shear forces both perpendicular and parallel to grain. Now, let's connect this back to trees being biological organisms as we discussed in the first lecture. Trees, like all living things, are subject to evolutionary pressures. 
the strength of wood comes not from crystal structures, but from individual cell walls. So, um, in the, something like steel, again, this, the material strength comes from the strength of the crystalline microstructure. But in trees, the uh, strength of the tree is going to come from the individual cell walls, and the strength of those cell walls and the uh, bonding mechanisms, the, the chemical compounds that bond uh, one cell wall to another. So, um, again, the strength of wood comes not from crystal structures, but from individual, from individual cell walls and the, their connecting elements. So, and just like every part of a tree, these don't just form spontaneously uh, through, say, crystal formation or from the hardening of cement or what have you. These do not just form, they are grown. And crucially, the direction of this growth is not random. Uh, tree cells, like all organisms, don't just grow in a random direction. Uh, think of any kind of organism. Think, oh, heck, think of the human body. Uh, when the human body grows during um, your, as you grow up, or if you want to go back earlier during uh, fetal development, what have you, uh, each cell grows according to certain genetic and chemical pathways. And if in that, and that is necessary in, for, in order for all of your internal and external structures to grow properly. And so uh, this does not happen randomly in just some random jumble of cells. Uh, they grow according to preset mechanisms. So the direction of the growth is not random, but the direction of a tree's uh, uh, cell growth is controlled by the, that tree's genetics and surrounding environment. Again, it is crucial to keep in mind that a tree's cell growth is not random. It comes from its genetics and from its environmental stimuli. So, um, and if you recall back from the first lecture, tree cells are highly elongated and, crucially, they grow in the direction of the grain. Again, tree cells grow in the direction of the grain. So, uh, think back to the analogy we used in the previous lesson. Uh, again, remember that you can think of trees uh, as a bundle of straws. So if I have a bundle of straws, I can pull apart a bundle of straws without actually breaking a single straw. Uh, I, so merely by separating one straw from another. If I want to break a bundle of straws apart, I don't actually have to sever an, indiv an individual straw. I merely have to separate or overcome their binding force. So pulling a single straw apart takes a lot more force than separating a straw from its neighbors. And ultimately, this is the same, uh, the same kind of thing applies for wood. It's a little more complicated, of course, but the same is ultimately true for trees. Uh, wood fibers will, exist, will exhibit much, much higher tensile and compressive strengths parallel to the grain than perpendicular to the grain. And the reason for that, again, is that when I'm applying forces parallel to the grain, I'm trying to actually break in half a single wood fiber or separate or uh, uh, pull apart a single wood fiber or elongate or compress a single wood fiber. When I apply compression, a compressive or in particular tensile stresses perpendicular to the grain, I am merely trying to separate one wood fiber from its adjacent wood fiber. So uh, to illustrate this, let's perform a simple demonstration. To do this, I prepared two physical wood specimens. I cut each di uh, from directly adjacent locations in a section of pine. In other words, these two, p uh, two pieces shown were literally cut from the exact same board. In fact, they were cut from a section of board directly adjacent to each other. So I cut one and then right next to it, I cut another. In terms of dimensions, these sections are uh, three quarter inch thick because it's this was a one by uh, pine board, uh, and we'll learn more about sizing details in later lectures. But these sections are approximately three quarter inch thick, approximately one inch wide, and approximately four inches long. I then marked each so that I could load them into the same position in, as a cantilever beam in the jaws of my uh, bench vise. So again, the dimensions of each are identical. However, I made one very crucial difference in the, manu in the manufacture of each of these specimens. Uh, one was cut with its length parallel to the grain, and the other was cut with its length perpendicular to the grain. So um, think about what we know about this, or what we know about, uh, or what we've learned about the strength of wood perpendicular and parallel to grain. Um, if we have a beam, if we have two different specimens, or two different beams in this case, one with its length parallel to the grain and one perpendicular, imagine I put them each into bending. 
I would expect the one that has its length perpendicular to the crane to have a, a much lower strength or to fail to fail much easier, simply because it uh, when I then put it into uh, bending, I'll be applying stresses perpendicular to the grain rather than parallel to the grain. Uh, as we can see here, I then proceeded to run some precision impact bending tests. And, of course, by, quote, precision impact bending tests, I mean I whacked them a, a couple of times with a series of hammers. So, uh, first of all, I gave, I gave each a series of light taps with a rubber mallet. Uh, I just had a rubber mallet, and I just gave each a light tap. Uh, first up is the parallel to grain beam. Uh, and as you can note, even after multiple light taps with the mallet, the beam was completely undamaged. The sample did not exhibit any significant damage, even, even after being tapped lightly repeatedly with this rubber mallet. Next, I repeated this rubber mallet test with the beam cut perpendicular to grain. And as you can see in this video, it failed uh, not only uh, slightly, but it completely failed. It failed completely, completely shearing off uh, at the support even with just a single light tap, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't taking this mallet and swinging with all my strength. I was just giving this a very light tap in both of these cases. But uh, even though the uh, the specimen that was oriented parallel to grain, it had its length parallel to grain, was able to resist repeated and increasingly strong wax with the rubber mallet, the uh, one with the uh, its length perpendicular to grain failed with just a single light tap. And again, consider what type of forces are being applied here. This ultimately is a bending test. I'm applying a force that is going to be perpendicular to the length of the element, and so I'm gonna, as I strike each specimen with the mallet, I put it into bending. So ultimately, each specimen is a dynamically loaded cantilever beam. So while the parallel to grain beam was clearly superior, I wanted to see how much the parallel to grain specimen could manage. To do this, well, I decided to give it a bigger whack. So I put away my rubber mallet and I moved on to a steel hammer. And what do you know, again, after several whacks of increasing force, the specimen still did not fail. Finally, I decided to reach for the big guns. I decided to pull out my big wooden mallet. I sometimes use this comically large mallet for driving chisels, or sometimes when I just want to hit something really, really hard, as in this case. Alas, the sample still stubbornly refused to die, and even after repeated attempts, uh, whacking it with both a rubber mallet, a giant wooden mallet, and a steel hammer, it still stubbornly refused to break. So I did what I had to do, and I finally gave in and realized a hammer wasn't going to work. So as you can see in this video, I uh, turned to, um, let's say, let's just say alternate methods. So, uh, so far we have discussed the strength of wood in relation to grain direction qualitatively, but we haven't yet considered it quantitatively. Consider the values here shown. We haven't in introduced the NDS properly yet, but we will do so in later videos. For now, I just want to consider some sample values. Uh, these values come from Table 4A in the NDS supplement, if you're curious, and these values apply to spruce pine fir numbers 1 and 2. For now, don't worry about the lumber and its uh, classification. The important thing here is the values shown. For now, just realize that these are the base stresses that the NDS allows for this type of species and this grade of wood considered, uh, under the various types of loading shown. Considering these values, what do you note? Well, first of all, notice that the highest value is compression parallel to grain. If we think back to the previous discussions, the greatest, again, the greatest force a tree trunk must carry is the weight of the tree branches that it holds up. Thus, this should be expected. Uh, tension parallel to grain is much lower, as a tree trunk will rarely if ever go into complete tension. And then look at the value for bending. Bending stress is a combination of tension and compression, and if you look at the value for this, the allowable bending stress is somewhere between the tension and compression values. I think this is kind of cool. You can actually see how basic mechanics works through the actual allowable values here. Uh, compression, the, the tree experience is the strongest in compression, weaker in tension, at both parallel to the grain, and bending, since bending is a combination of the two, actually has a stress value somewhere between. I think that's pretty neat. Although, um, I may have different definitions than you of what I consider particularly neat. 
Uh, next, consider uh, compression perpendicular to the crane. We can also see that comp that compression perpendicular to the crane is much, much lower than compression parallel to crane. And the reason for that, again, is just like with all of these material properties, uh, trees have grown in nature under evolutionary pressure. A tree rarely, if ever, needs to needs to resist compression perpendicular to grain. Therefore, it doesn't need that extra capacity and evolution has uh, weaned that down over the millennia or over the eons. Actually, millions of years if you think about the evolutionary history of trees. So again, compression perpendicular to grain is much lower as seen here than compression parallel to grain. So looking at these values, what seems to be absent? Well, uh, first shear perpendicular to grain seems to be missing. Notice there is a shear parallel to the grain value provided, but there is not a corresponding shear perpendicular to grain value provided. At first this seems odd, after all we have compression um, perpendicular and parallel to grain, why not shear? But it's actually omitted for a very good reason. Again, if you remember back to basic mechanics, as basic mechanics teaches, as we've discussed already in this lecture, when you apply shear parallel to the grain, you inevitably also apply the same shear value perpendicular to grain. So if we're going to load a uh, given sample of wood uh, with 50 psi parallel to the grain, we're also going to load it 50 psi perpendicular to the grain. And again, think back to just the static equilibrium of a basic differential or stress element. Now, again, think of wood as a, as a bundle of straws. Let's go back to our uh, very common metaphor that we'll be using. Think of wood again, imagine in your mind's eye, wood as a bundle of straws. Shearing wood perpendicular to the grain involves actually shearing or severing individual straws. Uh, can contrast this to shearing parallel to grain. Shearing it parallel to grain merely requires sliding one uh, bit of uh, straw or, sli or sliding one straw past another. So again, it's always going to require more force to actually break one of those straws than move the straws relative to each other. So it shouldn't surprise us that um, that shear strength uh, parallel to grain is much, much lower than shear strength perpendicular to grain. Again, because uh, shearing a uh, section of wood uh, perpendicular to grain is going to require severing uh, some of the wood fibers, while shearing parallel to grain is simply going to require uh, moving wood fibers past each other. Thus again, the shear strength parallel to grain is much, much lower than the shear strength perpendicular to grain. Since shearing always occurs both parallel and perpendicular simultaneously, the shear parallel to grain always controls. Thus, the NDS only reports shear parallel to grain. Uh, the much va higher value for shear perpendicular to grain is omitted as it simply never controls in almost any conceivable loading case. Again, because when you actually apply shear to a differential element, you apply the same shear stress to all four sides simultaneously. Um, Again, because you're applying the same shear stress to all four sides simultaneously, you're basically loading it in the same shear stress, both parallel and perpendicular, and since the parallel stress always controls, the NDS only includes that value. You can actually, you could actually uh, calculate or measure the shear stress uh, perpendicular to grain, but would be much higher, and thus, because we don't actually ever need to use it for the design, the NDS simply omits it, and uh, what that allows is that just that basically including it would not help us at all in terms of actual design It would just give another opportunity for people to make a mistake So for example when looking up shear values, they might accidentally use that value for uh, designers might accidentally use the value perpendicular to crane rather than the value parallel to grain, and then they might predict they have more shear capacity than they actually do. Finally, there is one more omitted value that is tension perpendicular to grain this value is much lower than tension parallel to grain. Again, think back to the example of wood as a series of straws. Tension perpendicular involves pulling straws apart, while tension parallel involves stretching out individual straws. In fact, tensile capacity perpendicular to grain is so low that stress values are not even provided by the NDS. In general wood design, we consider the tensile stress perpendicular to grain as zero, now, of course, in reality, wood will have some small amount of tensile capacity perpendicular to grain, but when actually doing design, we completely ignore it. It's so low, we neglect it completely. So since, uh, again, some tensile stress or some tensile strength does exist, but it is so low and variable uh, that we just ultimately do not rely on it at all. 
and this is kind of like concrete. If you remember to concrete design, uh, concrete does actually in truth have a small amount of tensile capacity, but when designing reinforced concrete beams, we ignore it completely. And just rely on, the, like as we mentioned previously, we rely on the steel to carry all of the tensile forces in a um, reinforced concrete member. So finally, what about compression perpendicular to grain? A value here is provided, but uh, let's consider this again. Think back again to our uh, oft-repeated bundle of straws. Though compression strength perpendicular to grain is much lower than parallel to grain, the individual straws can still bear against each other when a force is applied perpendicular to grain. So if I push a, a bundle of straws together, they can bear against each other and resist more, resist some uh, substantial amount of force that way. Uh, they're nowhere near as strong, of course, as compression parallel to grain, but in bearing, they can resist uh, a good amount of force. And in truth, if you dig into the literature, you find that the compression strength perpendicular to grain is actually a, really not a true stress limit. Rather, it is actually more of a rated limit based on allowable deflection. We allow or define a certain amount of, uh, cr comp of crushing perpendicular to grain as allowable, and the stress required to produce that is defined as our allowable compression perpendicular to grain stress. It's really more of a deflection limit or a stress based on a deflection limit than a true uh, allowable stress level. Thus, we can see the strength of wood as a material is intimately tied to the fact that trees are ultimately biological organisms. Trees go through a growth process, they grow, they live, they die, just like every biological organism. The material strength of wood relates directly to the types of forces that trees experience in nature. As such, as we have discussed, it is uh, not an isotropic material, it is an orthotropic material, it does not exhibit properties independent of direction, like say, steel might. Its material strength is highly dependent on the direction it is loaded. And again, this doesn't just mean whether we're putting it into tension or compression, but whether we're applying, say, tension perpendicular to grain or tension parallel to grain. Remember this principle and put it to heart. This will be a core design tenet we use as we learn the methods of structural wood design going forward in this course lecture series. All right, and with that, I think we'll wrap up for today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. Of course, I hope you found this video informative or perhaps enjoyable. If you did, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. And furthermore, if you would like to support our channel and would like to help make content like this possible, please see the link to our Patreon page in the description of this video. Regardless, I hope to see you all again soon in the next lecture in this video series. And of course, as always, thank you.